professional enough to have any of my poems memorized. No so worries, no worries. My apologies. Um, <clears throat> so, I, um, wow, you really can't see <laughs> any faces at all. This is amazing. It's really right. <laughs> um, so, I guess I just want to give you all um, a bit of a content warning. Uh, I talk about a lot of heavy stuff, um, including uh, suicide and domestic violence and being in love and it being very sad. So um, if anyone's uncomfortable with that, feel free to step out. Um, but I just want everyone to know. Um, in one moment, I actually have to change. I have to change my settings, but my phone doesn't turn off in the middle of me trying to do a phone. Yep. That sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Damn you iPhones! Oh, and racism also. I don't really do lots of content warning, but um, <laughs> if that makes you uncomfortable, I guess just deal with it because racism makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> okay, so this first poem is called White Girl. White girl, with your privilege and inherited wealth, long silky hair and fair skin and the heavy burden of your ancestors' sin. How you mimic me with your irons and your needles, gold hoops and tanning oils while I feel shame for the shade I was born in. Tell me, why must you strip me of my culture? Why must you revel in my pretty trends while I, while I am told I am ghetto for just wanting to fit in, but is it fitting in when I was four and I, I saw the confidence my mother wore in two inch hoops and natural braids, dark lipstick, high waisted jeans in every shade, Back when I aspired to be black and proud before the shame from my oppressors grew too loud, before I conformed to textures of hair that silenced the shame from my oppressors, that silenced the laughter of my peers until I learned that the, until they learned that the hair wasn't real. And then you, white girl, suddenly you make it okay. Long nails, big lips, fat asses, and every bit is fake. Apparently, being white makes my culture slay. Yet still, my braids are unprofessional, and when I, I paint my lipstick brown, I'm unapproachable. And when I show up my natural curves, I'm sexualized Hershey's. Or perhaps cute for a black chick, or maybe a little too thick. You see, it's just ain't the same with all this melanin, and in hindsight, we should have known you bleach because white girls love to steal from black queens, from our bodies to our tones to our integrity. When slave masters made us shave our heads bloody, even then, you envied us because your husbands wanted to fuck. Woo. So you stripped my mother's bone dry of every rejected notion that we ever owned except the oppression, the guilt, the hurt that's wrapped in my glowing dark skin. Well, you, white girl, you are your ancestor's sin. Ow! This one's called, um, I'm going to try to adjust it. Ah, yes, that's better. That's okay. almost about to fall, just so you're aware. This? Put yep. Put it down a little bit. Put it down just a little Just a touch. It's at a weird angle. goodbye today and I just wrote this recently. I said goodbye to Paul today. Remember Paul from the Kowalskis on Grand Avenue where we could have had it all. I said goodbye to the foliage and the trees, our yard, Sebastian's favorite place to be, where I would chase her and she would chase me. 
I said goodbye today to Aid Mill Road, the quick route to my job, goodbye to the bridge you told me to jump off. I said goodbye to the cuts, the bites, the bruises, the smacks and punches, a concussion, the verbal abuses. I said goodbye today to being called lazy, being called crazy, to always feeling so confused and hazy. I said goodbye to take out from Brasa and revival in the seafood place to your favorite to mine. Goodbye to all the good times. I said goodbye today to my home sweet home, a home you took from me because I did wrong. I said goodbye today to you and I. Goodbye 1217. Goodbye my little churro. Goodbye. This one's called, Well, Let's See. Well, let's see. A cute little mantra my brain likes to echo at me. Let's hold on just a little longer. If I'm sweet, if I'm good, if I can just hold down the pain, well, we can just see. If I give up, I have to face the shadows, put my belly where it's vulnerable, sitting up exposed, lonely, while you tower massive on the tips of your toes. I know I've done wrong, but is it really just me or am I grappling with the burdens of greater things? See, I never told you to die when you joked with me about suicide. I never smacked your eyes open wide when you got fed up with my little lies. In fact, I don't know how much I lied, let alone the deep invalidation broken boundaries, all those silly things I learned in my silly therapy, things that couldn't help me because I'm broken fundamentally. At least according to Mr. Perfect, or perhaps Vicar, I never claim to be perfect, and I don't care that I'm not perfect, even if my flaws shatter people's hearts beyond the structure of the muscles. I wondered, could I survive without you? Minus my sanity, minus the money, minus the care. Falsify or not, you were always there. My weeping little brain didn't mind whether or not it was fair, didn't mind being slapped, scentless, bullied, spineless, confuzzled, useless, because I had someone there. And God, compared to this torture, your good side, it was heaven. And when I'm drowning in the depths of perdition, what could mean more to me than the mercy of my personal Lord? You knew. You knew the puddle that became of me. You lapped me up, slurped down the bulk of me. What am I now besides blubbering, belligerent, my strength running so thin, feeling so cool, running so far, perhaps the only thing that could bring me back was heartache like this. But we'll see. See if you try to scare me. See about your petty offerings. See if your guilt tries to, see, see if your guilt drives you to make it up to me. But I've seen, I've opened my eyes to things, opened up my mouth to speak about the pain and the lies, the flows and the trails, and you'll see, my strength precedes me. This isn't my persevering name. I don't need to please someone who never really favors me, so let's see who keeps the boundaries. Let's see who really leaves things. Let's see. messaged a group chat with my mother, my brother, and my stepdad. It's Brandon's birthday, and he and I, we toyed with the idea of going to this skate thing. I say accidentally because I did that thing where I text the wrong person on purpose for, reason that, for reasons that have purpose, but this one I didn't quite understand. But if I hadn't clicked on the chat instead of Brandon's name, my mom would not have reached out to me after a little while asking, did he reply to your text? Because he didn't reply to mine. I am worried because it's not like him on his birthday. He and I are different in many ways and though he is shyer than I with the way he celebrates, just like me, my brother loves his birthday. Something feels wrong and I call my mom and she tells me to wait, that it's all going to be okay. 
yet she asked me to reach out to his friends in X amount of time. I can hardly wait until then, but I do, and it's been a couple of days since he's responded to them. I tell my mom, and she tells me to hold on. Gary's already at his apartment, and Brandon's best friend, Michelle, she's on her way. Mom's leaving now, and she'll let me know when she knows anything. She leaves me in limbo, and I say to my friends, I haven't heard from my brother, and I am worried for him. They say they're sure there's nothing wrong, and I say, well, lately he's been a little off. See, I've never seen my brother cry, not when we got yelled at, not even when Tina died. Yet days ago, we're standing outside Tona, Kona Grill, and he has tears in his eyes. We're begging him to come over so he can play with my dog, and he says no. We turn away, and when we look back, he's gone. And I know he went down to the parking garage, and I know we just had a tough talk about getting help when you're sad and that's okay for him to ask. But something felt wrong when he left that day. They tell me they are sure he's fine and that he might just need space. And to that I say, I'd kill him for putting me through this if he is at home safe. I am worried, and I call Quinn and he invites me over, even though it's Valentine's Day, and it's a little weird for him. I cry in front of my house before I pick up Sebastian, my dog, and my stomach. It's aching because something is wrong. Gary calls and he needs to know where I am. I'm on the road and I send them Quinn's address. I ask again and again what's wrong. Mom says they have answers that it's going to be okay. Yet still, I am deeply, deeply worried. I arrive and I'm pacing the room and Sebastian is hiding and Quinn is getting me some food. I watch for my mom out the window. I know Brandon is dead before she gets to the door. I ask her what happened. She is sorry. I ask again. He killed himself. I try to bang my head senseless against the window. I try to run away from the pain, but they all hold me back, asking where I am going. I don't know. I don't care. Anywhere. Next, I am sitting by the fire, and Sebastian's in my arms. I am asking how. He hanged himself. I have to wait until the family knows before I let our friends know, and I am worried. Because they lied to me, saying he was fine. He lied to me, saying he was fine a month ago when we, got, we went and got foe, and he cried over his breakup. We mentioned therapy, and he said he didn't need to go. I am worried because the, same, the pain settles in me a year later the same way it did on February 14th. I am worried because I don't know what's to come. Every time life feels normal, reality stabs me in the chest and reminds me that there is always pain to come. I still worry, and perhaps I always will. I am worried.